here is a pretty cool Bigfoot story that goes from a, just an average everyday activity to a terrifying activity. I think you guys will like it. In late August of 1985, my parents, my sister and wife and I spent time vacationing in Florida on the Gulf Coast. My wife and my older sister and I had driven down while my parents flew down together. My wife and I wanted to spend some time with my in-laws and my sister didn't want to fly back home to Chicago with my parents. Our vacation time was ending and we headed back to Chrysler. I was driving a 1985 Chrysler New Yorker with 4,000 miles on it, and the drive home was comfortable and relaxing. It was 3 a.m., and my sister was asleep in the front passenger seat while my wife slept in the back. I was driving on I-65. It's a four-lane highway north of Indianapolis. I was in the right lane, and there was little traffic, most of which were big rigs. A big rig passed me on the left, doing over 85 miles an hour, and as it passed, I could feel the air pushing my car to the right. I was doing about 70. I don't consider myself to have a lead foot by any means. Watching the truck passing over the slope in the roadway ahead, the rear taillights disappeared. I reached the top of the slope, and I could see the truck in the distance, but it was pulling away from me. I noticed the brake lights go on for a few seconds and then back off, and again the brake lights came on. They remained on for 15 seconds, as if it was slowing down for some reason, and after that the truck continued down the highway. I came down the other side of the slope where the truck had put its brakes on and I noticed a shadow of something on the right shoulder of the road. My thought was that it may be an abandoned vehicle that had mechanical problems. The night was calm and lit only by the moonlight, which did eliminate the darkness. Getting closer, I realized that the shadow was not that of a small car. I put my foot on the brake and I disengaged the cruise control, causing my car to slow. I put on my high beams and I still wasn't sure what I was seeing. I reached across to give my sister a rough shake to wake her. and At this point, I was yelling profanities. What the F is that? My sister woke up, and she looked at where I was pointing, and immediately she was overcome with fear. When we got closer, we saw a big buck on the right shoulder of the road. It was facing away from us, but I could see its rack on the right side of some big dark object. Between us and the deer was something huge and dark in color. My car had probably decelerated 30 miles an hour. My foot was still on the brake. I yelled back at my wife to wake up, but she never did. My sister was frantic and grasping at the console in the middle of the car. She was like, let's get the hell out of here. I was 35 yards from this thing, and I could make out the shape of it. Its large torso was V-shaped like that of a bodybuilder with a smaller waist and huge shoulders. It was facing away from us, and I could now see that it was covered in dark hair. It was so dark that I would say it was black, and it reminded me of an ape in the zoo, but its coat appeared shiny. That could have been because of my high beams being on it, though. We didn't see its face because it was turned away from us, and it looked as if it was squatting down, and it had its long arms on the underside of the deer, and it appeared to be busy eating. When we were almost beside it, I started to change lanes to the left. Not because of my sister yelling at me, but the fear that had welled up in me. We slowly started past this thing, and it turned its head to the left. It didn't turn its whole body, only its head. It didn't seem to have a neck, but the face of this creature looked wet. It wasn't a gorilla staring at us, and it wasn't a man. And neither one of us knew what to call it, and from its expression, it was not happy that we were there. My sister screamed at me, and I firmly pressed the accelerator to the floor. Because I was busy looking back out of the right side rear passenger window, I nearly lost control of the car. I put it into the grassy area between the northbound and southbound lanes, and after I got back onto the highway, I looked in the rearview mirror, and I swear this thing was watching us. 
I tried catching up to that trucker that was ahead of us since no other vehicles were heading north at the time. However, even with me driving over 95 miles an hour for 20 minutes, we never saw that rig again. My wife woke when we stopped for gas in northern Indiana. We told her of our horrific encounter, but she didn't believe us. I must admit that I'm not sure I would have believed such a tale either. Who would? That morning, I was so unnerved by the incident that I got a speeding ticket in Chicago for going 30 miles an hour over the speed limit on the Dan Ryan Expressway just trying to get home. My dad is a career law enforcement officer, and when we met at my parents' house later that night, my dad didn't believe us either. He asked if we'd been drinking, and then he admonished me for getting a speeding ticket. To this day, my sister and I don't talk about this to anyone outside of the immediate family. And if I bring it up in a conversation, it makes the hair stand up on our arms and the back of our necks. I don't know what we saw that night, but it was not a bear, a wolf, or anything I've ever seen before, and hopefully I'll never see one again. At under 30 feet in the distance in the amber glow of the side marker and opera light, It's an image we'll never forget. It has convinced me that there are some things out in nature that we have no clue about. I don't camp or hike or love the outdoors as I did my younger days. Now that I'm turning 60, I don't care what people think. I know what we saw and no one can ever take that away from us. And the writer signs off and man, what a great story. This is one from the safety of his car. It's exactly how I want to see a Bigfoot driving right past one. I'll probably stop and see if I can observe it going still, but he didn't. I think this thing scared him a little bit and they took off, but they're in the safety of their car and they drive by and they see a giant creature on the side of the road eating a deer. Now, how cool is that? I'm sorry you don't like the outdoors like you used to. You should, um, if you feel compelled to it, get back out in the woods. These reports are quite scarce. They're not. I don't think there's anything in the North American woods, especially where you live up in northern Illinois, that's going to hurt us. So, uh, but that's, uh, you may not like the outdoors anyway, and that's, that's cool. Ain't no problem at all. But I want to thank the writer for the story. It was very good. This is a story about a ghost, and he claims the story is true. I grew up hunting in the creek bottoms of the Pea River Basin that borders Pike and Barber Counties. I'm 50 now, although I still hunt, there's a lot more ever slow stalking involved these days. What I'm about to relate happened 33 years ago. Until now, I've only told it to one other person, but I know this is a place to share without ridicule or judgment. That has given me the courage to finally tell my tale. It was a cold, dry morning in late December of 1987, with little to no wind. Perfect conditions for hunting. We'd had a good acorn crop that year, and the swamp I was hunting was covered with several varieties of oak trees. The white oaks and the water oaks were the primary feeding source for the deer, and signs were everywhere. Scrapes and rubs were seemingly on every trail. The rut was getting into full swing. I walked half a mile to the bottoms where I came up on a large poplar tree that was down, likely from a recent storm. The leaves were still heavy on the tops of the trees, making a perfect natural ground blind. It's close proximity to two intersecting game trails that were well beaten down with tracks clinched my decision to make this my stand. Within 10 or 15 minutes of settling in, I watched as two mature does, both with yearlings, they fed through. More deer walked in over the next hour, and I was now optimistic a good buck would show himself. Because it was a dry day and the ground was covered in leaf litter, I heard each deer before seeing it from my vantage point in the fallen treetop. By 8.30 a.m., all was quiet. I was sitting motionless and focused on the trail crossing in front of me when I caught movement to my right. There was no noise to alert me, but I definitely saw something in my peripheral. I slowly turned my head 
and I was startled to find a man standing only ten feet from me. I never heard him approach through the thick layer of dead leaves. He just appeared. Our eyes met, and he asked in a whisper, Any luck? I shook my head and quietly said, Not yet, and I remained outwardly stoic, but my mind was racing with questions. How did this person walk up on me to within 10 feet without me hearing him? Even if he were walking excessively slow, I would have seen or at least heard him. How could he have come through those leaves without making a sound? I took in his appearance, noting that he was an older fellow, maybe in his 70s. He was dressed in old-fashioned dungaree overalls and wearing a red flannel jacket and a wool hat with ear flaps, much like the kind Elmer Fudd wears. His boots were equally archaic, and resting on his shoulders was an old rabbit ear double-barrel shotgun. This man had interrupted my hunt, and I wanted to get back to it, so I didn't say anything else. Instead, I kept glancing back over to the trail crossing, hoping he would get the hint. Finally, he whispered, Well, good luck. I didn't bother to look back over at him as I responded with something similar, and I continued to sit there with my eyes forward, waiting for the man to walk away. And I listened, and I waited. I never heard anything. And then I was thinking, Why is this man, who isn't even supposed to be on this property, insistent on ruining my hunt. Finally, I looked back at him with a why are you still here written all over my face, but he wasn't there. I swiveled around to look further behind me, and I didn't see him anywhere. There were no sounds of footsteps in the dried leaves, no sight of a red flannel jacket, and no wool Elmer Fudd hat disappearing through the woods. It had only been a few seconds, but the man had vanished completely and without a sound. I sat for 30 minutes trying to process what I had just experienced. Strangest of all to me was that I was not in the least bit afraid or even slightly unnerved. In fact, it was quite the opposite. I had an extremely calm and peaceful feeling come over me. I was only 17 years old. I was alone in the woods, and I was pretty damn sure I had just seen and talked to an actual ghost. I should have wet my overalls, yet never once during my brief encounter with the old hunter did I experience so much as an ounce of fear. When I got back to camp, my dad was out at the barn, cleaning a deer and whistling as he always did. I reluctantly told him what had happened, not leaving out any details. Dad looked at me straight in the eye and calmly asked, Did you say a red flannel and a rabbit ear double barrel? Yes, sir, I answered. That sounds a whole lot like Haywood Green. He owned this property before we bought it. I knew my dad and uncle had purchased the 660-acre tract of land in 1979 from the Green family, but what I didn't know was that it was put up for sale after the grandfather had died. His name was Haywood Shorty Green. He was an avid hunter who always had a shotgun with him, a rabbit ear double barrel Stevens 12 gauge, and he was said to always wear a red flannel jacket and blue jean overalls. I still hunt those woods and waters, but I've never seen the old man again. Thank you for letting me share my story, one that I've kept a secret for over three decades. Until now. Here's an email from Alabama. Man writes, uh, Many years ago, I worked as a chemical operator at a company near the airport close to Huntsville, Alabama. I was scheduled to work the third shift. Having extra time on my hands before work, just before dusk, I went down to the swamp that I knew had some good bass and bluegill. I wanted to try out some new fishing baits. I was standing near the edge of the road in the swamp casting my baits out when I heard a large tree snap and a crash near the back of the swamp. My first thought was that if a tree falls in the woods and nobody sees it, does it make a sound? Yes, they do make a sound. 
I had to laugh at myself for even thinking of that, but that's where my mind had gone. Two minutes later, another tree snapped in the same area. At this point, I had stopped fishing. My attention had been drawn elsewhere. I began walking the edge between the road and the swamp to get her brother look at the woods. As far as I could see, there wasn't anyone or anything around. The sun was beginning to set, therefore it was getting dark in the woods. And then I heard something running toward me, and it sounded like a small animal, which was nothing unusual, so it didn't bother me. And then scrambling out of a thicket in the woods was a red fox running right at me. And it passed me by two feet, which is very unusual. Foxes tend to avoid people. Many people were on their way home from work. There was a lot of traffic, but that fox never even hesitated as it crossed the road in front of me. It was obvious that something bigger had it running for its life. I turned back toward the part of the woods where the fox had come from, and I could smell what was chasing it. The smell was horrendous, as if a wet, dead goat <laughs> had been out in the hot summer sun for at least a week. And then an eerie feeling landed on me like a ton of bricks. It told me in no uncertain terms that I needed to make tracks and get the hell out of there. And that's exactly what I did. To this day, I have never gone back in the woods to investigate what made that ungodly smell. And it gave me that hellish feeling of dread. I know foxes don't normally run toward people, but this one was so terrified that it was on the run for its life and it didn't care about anything except living another day. I never saw a Bigfoot. However, I've never seen a panther either, but I'm sure panthers are as real as I am. So then why not Bigfoot? Two trees snapping, a fox running for its life, and that horrible smell, plus that feeling of dread were not just coincidences. It's too much for me not to investigate. So this fall... I'm prepared to do so. I'm going back into the woods to find out what I didn't see that day. Like the falling trees, I didn't see them, but I know they were there. Oh, that's a cool story. I don't think that leaves any doubt what that could have been, unless it was just like some smelly person who was living out in the swamps and they were chasing a fox. It's just as plausible as there being a Bigfoot. Huh? 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 All right, great story. Thanks to the writer for sending it. Let's take a little intermission here and let me talk to you about a couple of things. First, if you haven't subscribed to my other YouTube channel, it's called the What If It's True Podcast. You can do a search or click the little button in the upper right or left hand corner, wherever that shows up. You might want to go over there and subscribe because that channel is going to become the Steve Lilly Journals channel. And that's where all the Steve Lilly stories are going to go. I'm bringing all of the What If It's True stories that I've done through the years, bringing them over to Dixie. You may be hearing some of the, you, you have heard some of those already, but there's uh, 150,000 people subscribing to Dixie. And there's, I don't even remember what's going on with the What If It's True channel, maybe 20 or 30,000 subscribers. That is going to become the Steve Lilly channel. So if you want to go over there and subscribe right now, go for it so that you'll get notified when Steve Lilly launches toward the end of this month with the original 10 episodes that I've written and narrated and plus there'll be another five episodes right away, right out of the gate when the podcast launches. Uh, let's see, I thought I'd let you know that. Let's talk about Yeti Bars, yetibars.net. They're soap makers, all essential and natural oils and ingredients all made in america they're coming out with new soap bars almost by the week they've got a new bar out called the pennywise bar for halloween a new october yeti fest the tried and true forest fresh dream sickle orange bark bar dixie cryptid bar yeti hippie number one the hunter bar all of those the shroot the glacier all those bars are still available and again they're all made in america when you check out, use the code DC10 to get a 10% discount. You need to go take a look. Yetibars.net. And you can also find them on Facebook. All right. I've got one more 20-minute story. 
And then we'll end this podcast. And this next one is great. It's a werewolf story written by Dave Knuckles. Dave's a great writer. And most of his stories, probably all of his stories, are based on true events. You're going to enjoy this. All right, here we go. A Werewolf Legend The date is 1350 A.D. The Black Plague raged in Europe for many years. 20 million people died in five years before the plague ran its course. Those who could fled the cities and towns to escape the plague. Most took refuge in the forests, while others fled to the mountains. It was during this time in these dark and foreboding mountains that a horrible event took place. Bala and his family fled their home into the mountains as the plague took firm grip on their town. They were the last to escape. Some later said it was unfortunate that they did. Bala, his wife Chalitha, his two sons Christopher and Thingol, and his daughter Talia had set up a comfortable home in the forested hills that surrounded the mountains. Bala and his two sons were cutting and gathering firewood. Chris was 14 and Thingol was 16. Winter was approaching. They needed wood. Christopher wandered from his father and brother and was soon close to a dangerous cliff. He knew the danger and turned to find his father when he heard the sound of hungry puppies. Of course, he had to investigate. In the bank of a shallow rock formation, he found the opening to a wolf's den. Standing in the opening were two odd-looking puppies. Their features were different. They looked like wolves, but they didn't. Christopher gathered up one of the puppies and stroked its fur. Knowing that taking a wild animal was a bad idea, he returned the pup to the den and left to find his father. Not long after the young boy left, the she-wolf returned to her den to find one of her pups covered with the scent of humans. The father of the pups was a lycanthrope who preferred to stay in wolf form. The wolf man was angry. He had no choice but to kill this pup that had been handled by a human. After killing his own offspring, the werewolf went looking for the human, and it wasn't long before he found the trail and followed it to a small hut in the forest. It was getting late when the family decided to turn in for the night. Christopher laid down and his mother doused the lights. In the early hours of the morning came a howling that pierced the night. Chris woke with a start. He looked around the room he shared with his older brother. The moon outside was full and a stream of silver light poured in through the window. Above his head, he could see the shadow of a small tree just outside his window against the far wall. But the shadow of the tree changed and in a second, It was the shadow of a wolf standing on its hind legs. The wolf was enormous, bigger than any man Chris had ever seen. Thingol, Chris whispered, wake up. Thingol stirred under the bed covers and then opened his eyes. There at the window, silhouetted by the full moon, was a wolf man. Its eyes burned red and glowed, and Thingol sat up. As he did, the creature dived through the window frame and landed on Thingol's bed. The werewolf tore at Thingol's chest and neck and ripped out vital organs in his windpipe. By the time the wolf creature was finished, the boy lay in tatters on the bed. Blood covered the floor. The wolf turned to Chris, but as it did, the door to the room was thrown open and Bala and Chalitha bounded into the room. The werewolf flung his huge body out the window once more, and Chalitha ran to her dead son, moaning in shock and grief. Bala ran for his pitchfork and ran out the door. As Bala left the hut, a blow pounded him into the winter stockpile of wood, rendering him unconscious. Moments later, he woke to find the wolf towering over him. The werewolf bent down, and let the nail of its index finger touch Bala's Adam's apple. 
and with one flick of its finger sliced along Bala's neck. Bala died moments later, drowning in his own blood. The creature turned its attention to the house. It heard the sobs coming from Talia's bedroom. The twelve-year-old was asleep in her bed. The wolf's shadow creeped across her body. and When the girl woke, the wolf's jaws were inches from her. and She screamed when its jaws slammed shut on her face. The wolf creature stood and spat blood and pieces of flesh and bone onto the dirt floor. And Chalitha ran into the room to find her daughter's faceless body lying dead on the floor, the beast hovering over Talia's corpse, heaving. Horror and fear shot through her, and she ran back to her son's room to find Christopher. The creature blocked their escape through the door. Chalitha pulled her last remaining child to her breast. And Chris closed his eyes and he prayed. And he felt a slight jerk from his mother's arms. Opening his eyes, her head dropped to the floor with a thud. Her grip relaxed on her son and she fell to the floor. Chris looked about the room and death was everywhere. He knew he was next and he braced himself for the death blow. But the creature was gone. He stumbled through the house and out the door to exit the hut. There he found his father's body laying on top of the woodpile. Now in shock, Chris stumbled into the forest. The steam from his breath and the cold air streamed behind him. In the summer of 1351, a few months after the slaughter of the family, a group of woodsmen found the rotting corpses in the hut. All the family members were found except one. One young boy was accounted for. His remains were never recovered. All that remained was speculation and rumors. The account of this tragedy was recited to a local clergyman by the woodsman who discovered the horrors in the little mountain home. The local priest wrote the news in a letter to other churches in the region where it was read to congregants and from there the letters were read aloud in public gatherings and in pubs. The story traveled far and wide by word of mouth, with little exaggeration. This is the way news traveled in medieval Europe. Months later, one of the tattered letters was read aloud in a seedy pub to a gathering of drunken patrons. The usual rowdiness of the place went silent as the publican narrated the events of that grisly day. After the reading, the crowd, now deflated from their prior cheerfulness, dispersed and most left the pub to get home. But seated at a table alone in the darkest corner of the pub sat a man cloaked in the usual attire of a woodsman. His face was obscured by the hood pulled over his head, where a pipe extended into the dim light. Smoke rose from beneath the hood with each draw of tobacco, and when the pub had nearly cleared of people, the man rose from the table, finished his ale, paid the maid who had served him, and walked out into the night. Two days later, the dark stranger arrived in the village where Bala and his family had fled before being slaughtered in the mountains. The stranger found the church where he would find the clergyman who wrote the account. Late that night, he entered the church and gutted the priest. Throughout the next weeks, he found each of the woodsmen who had told the first-hand story. Every eyewitness was killed one by one. The lichen who entered the house of Bala's family all those years ago had avenged the lies told about his actions that day. 671 years later, on October 13, 2021, a blog was posted on a popular website. The writer claims to tell the story as it really happened. He also claims that he is the lichen that entered Bala's house in the year 1350. This is what he wrote. Lies, slanderous lies told by cowards to entertain and frighten drunken travelers. Now we are demonized as dogmen. Dogmen? 
We're not dogs. It's all sensationalism to entertain. But these lies create a creature in the human mind that is vicious and hungers for human flesh. To be clear, we only take humans when humans have exterminated our food supply. We are driven to survive, no different than any animal, including humans. The human plague was driving them into the forest from Rothenburg, an old Bavarian village in the south of Germany. Not that humans are bad, but they're dumb. I've been within a stone's throw of their hovels, and unless I wished to make my presence known, they didn't realize I was there. Humans are a problem, though. They are loud. The noises they make and the smoke from their fires had the game animals heading deeper into the forest, and we being hunters were obliged to follow. My mate Isha and I were scouting out a den deep in the gloom far from this human pestilence when a boy discovered our pups. Had this happened one day later, we would have been gone. But boys being boys, this young human picked one from the litter and took it back to one of the hovels humans had built. Isha was furious and had sent me to retrieve the pup as she made her tracks back and forth to the new den moving our brood. I was to have the missing pup to the den by daybreak or there would be no peace. There is no fury like that of a mother she-wolf and I would rather face a whole torch-bearing village of bloodthirsty humans than meet her at sunrise without that pup. The scent was easy to follow and I howled to my son to come to me from the tree line. I heard him whimper and growl at his captor. The lichen are a free people, and I knew the human had restrained him from coming to me wishing to enslave him. They wish to do this the hard way. So be it. I approached the hutch. A man and a boy came out, and I could tell by his scent that this boy was older than the one who took the pup. He had a burning stick and a heavy poker from the fireplace in his hand. The man held a pitchfork, and they were waving the burning sticks and yelling in guttural tones. I was still on all fours. They must have thought me a common wolf. But as I stood, the fear I had been smelling turned to absolute terror, and the man let loose with a string of prayers and mixed with curses. A terrified human is a dangerous thing, so I told him in his language that I was only here for my pup, and I intended to hurt no one. The humans were either too dumb or too vain to have complied with my request. The fool charged me, trying to impale me with a pitchfork. Time runs slow to my kind, and we can count the beats of a fly's wings and catch a hunter's arrow in mid-flight. So I sidestepped the pitchfork easily and with the slap sent the man falling into the woodpile. I used more force than I should have. His arm was injured and scars would remain, but he would heal. Humans are soft, pink, and fragile, and it's hard to touch them without drawing blood. The boy dropped his torch and iron poker and ran back into the hut, screaming for his mother. And I turned my attention to the man. I could hear his heart beat a steady rhythm. He was out cold, but he was healthy. He would survive. I entered the house on all fours. The ceiling was too low to accommodate my standing height. I poked my head through the cloth and I growled. The woman was there holding two of the youngest children tight. They were terrified in a corner. The boy looked up at me with some rage. I growled so the fight would leave him. The others were in shock and not a threat. I headed to the back room where I knew the pup to be, and I heard his growls become fiercer with me nearby. Inside the room, the boy held the pup tight against his chest as if to protect the pup from his own father. The scent of blood hung in the air, and I saw it dripping from the human's arms where my son had bitten him with his renewed confidence. With the blood, I caught the scent of adrenaline. A sense of defiance spread across the boy's face. There was no fear with this one. Growling and baring my teeth to scare the boy made no difference. All I wanted was my son. I had no interest in killing these humans. 
The boy released the pup, and I was relieved that we could end this ordeal without shedding blood. But the boy wasn't finished. I caught the scent of adrenaline again, and he charged me without a weapon. He was a brave child, and I suppose his survival instinct took over. Avoiding contact with him would have been easy in the open, but we were in a small, confined space. I sidestepped his charge. My top canine nicked his scalp as he rushed past and crashed into the wall. I must stop here to explain that lichens are born. They're not made. We are as natural to the world as any animal on the planet. The few things that separate us from others are these. We are able to walk upright or as a normal wolf on four limbs. With this ability, we are able to mix with humans if we can conceal our likeness in clothing. It is a rule that we only do this at night when the human eyesight is at its worst. Next, our brain is human-like. We reason. We experience emotions. We are happy and we're sad. Last, our lifespan is a thousand years or more. We are few, but we inhabit the planet in many places out of sight and undetected by humans. No, we are not made as the stories portray us. A bite from a lichen will infect a human, causing them to become a version of us, but they are not lichens. A turned human is the most evil, foul, and murderous creature on this earth. We never attack a human and allow it to live. A turned human will be hunted by lichens to ensure that no harm comes from their existence. The wound inadvertently given to this young boy should not have infected him, but to be sure, I left the hut with my son, and we watched from the tree line at a distance for several hours. Later, to my disappointment, I heard the tell-tale sounds that I dreaded. The boy was devouring his own family. Before I could act, he was out the door and on to his father, and I reached him as he dealt the death bite. With little effort, I dispatched the young mutant with a bite to the back of its head. His body thumped limp to the ground. I then left with my son and the corpse of the dead boy. Halfway to our new den, my son and I dug a grave and buried the body. It will never be found. And in half a day, I was with Isha and our brood in a new den, far away from any human. The words I have written here are true. I do not expect my admission to be believed over the reprehensible lies told as horror stories about my kind. But it is the truth. We are not your enemy. We are not what you think we are. All right, thanks for hanging with me on this podcast. If you liked it, you can give me a thumbs up, maybe even subscribe, but make sure and come back for the next episode. And on the end screen, you're probably seeing it right now, is a video from the What If It's True podcast. If you haven't gone over there and subscribed yet, you need to do it now. Just click on this video. I think it's the last or next to last podcast I put out that is specifically for the What If It's True podcast. Listen to the story, subscribe over there because it is going to become the Steve Lilly channel. It's where all the Steve Lilly stuff is going to be. It's not going to be on Dixie. It's going to be on the Steve Lilly Journals channel. Go over there and subscribe now and click the bell icon and all that stuff so you can get notified when Steve Lilly launches here in a couple of three weeks. All right. I appreciate you guys again. Hope you're having a good week and we'll see you on the next one. Thanks. Thanks.